I'm Carolyn Shapiro, Associate Professor of Law and Director of the Institute on the Supreme Court of the United States at IIT Chicago Kent College of Law. I'm here today to talk about the Fisher versus University of Texas case, along with my colleague Sheldon Neymod, a Professor of Law here at Chicago Kent. Um, we're going to start by talking a little bit about the background of the case, what led the University of Texas to create the Affirmative Action Program that is at issue here. Um, it, it started actually back in the 1990s, is that right, Shell? Yes, with the Hopwood case. And what was Hopwood about? The Hopwood case was a uh, decision involving the use of uh, racial factors in university admissions, so specifically applicable to the University of Texas. And the Fifth Circuit in the Hopwood case basically said that that is unconstitutional, that the use of racial criteria in this setting violates the Equal Protection Clause, even if the use of the racial criteria are supposedly benign. So uh, the Supreme Court was asked to take the Hopwood case, but didn't. It did not, correct. Um, and, and actually, the two of the justices, I believe, issued an opinion explaining that the case, that didn't necessarily mean they agreed with the whole. Right. Uh, so subsequent to Hopwood, the University of Texas was, of course, bound by the Fifth Circuit. So what did it do? The University of Texas uh, adopted what's called, uh, can be characterized as a race-neutral admissions policy for the University of Texas. It, uh, top 10% law is what it enacted, and basically it's And that was actually the Texas that. legislature. The Texas enacted. legislature did that and uh, effectively uh, admitted students in every public uh, secondary school to the University of Texas if they were in the top 10%. And did that have an effect on the racial makeup of the, of the student body? Yes, that did have an effect and uh, generally a beneficial one, although subsequently, as we'll see, uh, the University of Texas authorities thought that that was not beneficial enough. Yes. And when you say beneficial, promoting, creating a diverse student yes, body? Yes, creating a, uh, an academically diverse student body. So after, uh, after Hopwood, after the, t the adoption of the top 10% plan, the, the Supreme Court actually did have an occasion to revisit the question of affirmative action in higher education. Can you talk a little bit about sure. that? That's the, uh, the famous uh, two cases, really, one of them involving the University of Michigan undergraduate uh, college. That's the Gratz case, but more important uh, for our concerns is the Grutter case, which involved the University of Michigan Law School, and the Supreme Court held there uh, that the use of racial of a racial criterion uh, as one of various factors for uh, law school admissions and by implication college admissions as well was constitutional. So long as each student, each applicant was treated as an individual and so long as, as I say, race was only one factor, one criterion, uh, and there were other factors as well. In other words, a kind of holistic uh, individual Holistic uh, approach to admissions, and that was constitutional. So it's sort of a, a race as a as a, one of a fact factor. Like we might look, a university might look at geography, might look at economic background, might look at uh, musical ability, a, a whole range of different. Exactly right. Factors. And actually, that went back to a uh, Supreme Court uh, decision, a single opinion by Justice Powell in the Bakke case in the 1970s, where he held that uh, the use of race for benign purposes is constitutional where in the university setting it is designed to promote academic diversity. Notice I didn't say racial diversity, I said academic diversity, and it was that approach that the Supreme Court bought into uh, decades later in the Grutter case, which is what poses the issue, one of the issues in the uh, Fisher case today. So can you say a little more about academic diversity and what, w how that might be distinct from racial diversity and what role that plays? Sure, in let reasoning? me give you just a, a little bit of background on, on that. Uh, the Supreme Court held uh, several decades ago that race in lawyer-like terms, uh, legal terms, is a suspect classification. And that uh, doesn't, doesn't matter whether race is used invidiously or whether race is used 
uh, for benign purposes. Uh, it is a suspect classification which triggers what lawyers call strict scrutiny. That's a heavy burden for governments to overcome. Strict scrutiny means you need a compelling governmental interest, and then even if you have a compelling governmental interest, the next question is, were there race-neutral means that were available, narrowly tailored uh, race-neutral means that were available to uh, promote the compelling governmental interest? And I think uh, viewers might be interested to know that thus far there are two of them two compelling governmental interests. One in the non-academic setting is to, actually it implies to the academic setting as well, it could, to remedy past racial discrimination by the particular entity that uh, set up the affirmative action program. The other, specifically limited uh, to the academic setting, is academic diversity. It's really tied in, in a way, to academic freedom, the idea that you need multiple voices, you need multiple viewpoints, uh, and the like, uh, in the university setting, in the classroom setting as well. So academic diversity is a compelling governmental interest, and that's what the court uh, dealt with in Grutter and in the Gratz case as well, which was struck down in Gratz for other reasons, uh, and will now be at, at uh, issue in the Fisher case. So a uh, compelling governmental interest is creating a, a student body that is diverse enough in lots of different ways and racial diversity can contribute to this academic diversity. So that's why it can be one of a number of individualized factors yes. that an admissions com committee looks at. So th that's the, the legal background. In Fisher, of course, uh, we already had, the, Texas had this top 10% plan, which was race neutral. Perfectly constitutional. Uh, so what happened in, in Texas to, to bring this case to the Supreme Court? Well, uh, in 2006, that Grutter case that I told you about was handed down by the Supreme Court in which uh, basically said that Hopwood got it wrong, and indeed in the university and the higher education setting, race is a permissible factor. Uh, to use to promote academic, to generate academic diversity. So apparently the University of Texas folks said, hey, you know what? We can promote uh, academic diversity even better than our top 10% law does by instituting uh, a, uh, an affirmative action program for the uh, percentage of folks. Uh, let's leave some slots available for the percentage of folks who don't get in under our 10% plan. It's usually 15 to 20% that are not admitted at the University of Texas under the top 10% plan. And let's see if we can promote academic uh, diversity that way. In other words, let's do a little more. So, Shell, can you talk a little bit about what the numeric difference was in, in admissions under the top 10% plan alone and then again after the University of Texas implemented this new plan? Sure, in, uh, in uh, 2008, uh, there were about 30,000 applications for the University of uh, Texas, and there were a, f a little over 6,700 students admitted. Of those 6,700 students, 550 under the top 10% law were African Americans. Uh, the Affirmative Action Plan, which was based on this Individualized Personal Achievement Index, which used race as one of many factors, uh, permitted the admission of another 150 African American students. So, you know, it's not an insubstantial effect, although the parties in their briefs fight about whether it's worth having this affirmative action plan just for 150 additional African American students. The, the use of this additional affirmative action plan uh, created a situation where more than 10% of the student body was African American, whereas before it was under 10%. Correct. Uh, in our next segment, we'll talk a little bit about what the legal questions are that are gonna be confronting the Supreme Court in Fisher. Sounds good. <laughs>